<clears throat> Namaste and in Lockettes, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel. And if you're not sure what Namaste and in Lockettes means, review some of my older <laughs> shows. I, I say this, everyone, I've been doing it for over a year and a half. So I hope the message finally gets through. Go back, listen to it, and try it for yourself. All right. Um, so this week's guest, it was hard for me to do is come out of that and, and not go into that same pattern. Pattern breaking. Wow, what a novel idea. So this week's guest is Victor Akista. He is a doctor. Uh, he's also a fictional, non-fictional author and speaker, uh, writing to raise consciousness. And I'm, some of his writings are just fascinating. You really do need to take a look. He's a positive uh, or a podcast creator, positive one, and a host at Pod Fobbler Productions. Interesting name. So Victor speaks and writes extensively on the topic of raising consciousness, mysticism, and transformation. Uh, he graduated uh, as a doctor from the Robert Larner College of Medicine at University of Vermont. He also has a degree in neurobiology and behavior from Cornell. Uh, he's a featured contributor on Biz Catalyst, and he's a board member of the Mystery Writers of America, Florida chapter. Now, he's also written, as I said, written extensively. Um, he's written a number of books as well, and they are The Serpent Rising, uh, Revelation, and Sentiment, and those are all on Amazon. He's the founder and director of Pathways Integral or Integral health and wellness. Victor, glad to have you here. This is going to be an amazing conversation. Well, thank you, Zen. Thanks for having me on the show and, and for your uh, introduction. And I will just re return the namaste and in Lakesh to you and um, go back and, and look at some of Zen's previous recordings. And you listeners will know exactly where we're coming from. Absolutely. And, and don't believe it. Try it yourself. Test it out it actually works. Yes. All right. So we've had a, a, a wonderful uh, building relationship so far via text and Zoom and all kinds of stuff and, and interchanges on LinkedIn through the Biz Catalyst articles and things like that, uh, as well as the Friendship Bench. And if uh, y'all don't know about Friendship Bench, you should visit bizcatalyst360.com and find out more there. It's a wonderful group. Uh, a psychologically safe and intellectually humble environment to just explore yourself and others, um, which is kind of how we first met. <laughs> and so how, uh, going back into uh, the Wayback Machine, and then we're both familiar with that, let's join Sherman and Peabody for a moment and, and look into how you first began to understand this inner awareness that you obviously have and, and the quest that you have to understand the greater aspect of being. Now, I know uh, when you were younger, that didn't come through that way because we don't have the vocabulary or understanding for it yet. But how did that come about with you? And what was your, what were you going through in your life at the time? And, and how did you engage that understanding? Yeah, so I, I appreciate that question. Um, I remember having a conversation with my mother when I was in seventh or eighth grade, and the substance of it was, Mom, I, I just feel like I'm different than other kids. Of course, I was doing great in school and, and all that, and, and doing all the things that kids normally do. Grew up in a big family with, uh, I was the fifth of seven children. Hmm. Um, but I felt different, and I couldn't really... Uh, put my finger on on in what ways that was. Um, I uh, was fortunate to have older siblings who uh, were interested in things like philosophy and um, to an extent spirituality. So we had a library of books um, that included uh, some some things that I probably shouldn't have been reading at the young age that I was reading. I couldn't fully understand them, but uh, like Krishnamurti, um, which I, I think a lot of your viewers would be familiar with some of his work, 
I absolutely love the poetry and the writings of Khalil Gibran. And those were more, um, you know, mystical uh, kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's uh, books by Soren Kierkegaard, and I couldn't understand. That was too dense for me. Um, well, at a junior I, high level, yeah, I can imagine. I, I was reading, well, this was more moving into high school at that point. Okay. But I was reading Auspensky, a, a new model for the universe. Um, I mean, th there was some some deep stuff, time and free will. Um, and all of these were planting seeds in, in my head to um, help me to understand that there's, there's a lot that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. but I, Let me ask you a question in that. So this is the outer activity. What was going on inside of you? in that process. In, inside of me, I wanted to have a, a better understanding, not only of myself, but of, of reality. Um, but as the Buddhists say, um, you know, our challenge in life is to find our song and sing our song. Mm. I, I, I hadn't found my song yet. And um, I, you know, went through a very a traditional program of uh, training to be a doctor uh, in internal medicine. I did a fellowship in preventive medicine. I was very interested in health and wellness, but I un understand that now from a different perspective, retrospectively, uh, it's not so much that I wanted to be a doctor so much as my, one of my, my core missions is as a healer. Mm -hmm. And this was the, the chosen avenue to, uh, you know, to, to, have that song sung. Sure, I, I can totally relate to that myself. I, I started uh, college in a pre-med program. Um, I, two reasons, I wanted to be a healer. That was the only direction that I knew. And my uncle was uh, a general practitioner for our village, if you will, small town. And I just loved his attitude, his bedside manner, the ability that that gave him to help others. Um, and yet there was still, like you say, something missing. This was the allopathic external, more modus operandi, rather than the real healing, which is what happens within. Well, uh, you're, you're segueing into, you know, the comments I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, to, to... Not that I'm sensitive or anything. Yeah, well, I, I too had an uncle and, you know, he could have been a, a role model for Marcus Welby, MD. I mean, it was that family physician and right. the warmth and being involved in people's lives. And that, that was very appealing to me. And I wanted to, um, you know, experience that uh, as, as a uh, practitioner, as a provider. Of course, medicine changed a lot, but the whole... Um, model of care that I was trained in has a severe um, training bias that goes with it. And it's, it, you know, it's similar to if, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. I realized during my practice as a primary care physician that my training was very inadequate uh, and that uh, there were alternative ways of approaching health and healing that I needed to understand. So I, I, I read and I learned a lot about Chinese medicine. I learned a lot about Ayurvedic medicine. I learned about other things that um, um, were maybe not so mainstream. I, I got trained as a level one Reiki practitioner. I was very interested in energy-based approaches mm -hmm. to care. Um, but any, any technique, whether it's massage or Feldenkrais or um, you know, wh whatever, uh, chiropractic, of course, there was a antagonism towards chiropractors from, you know, the, the way that I had trained that they, oh, they don't know what they're doing, except I saw chiropractors because I was having a lot of back trouble. <laughs> I thought they were great. <laughs> I thought they had something to offer that I didn't have. Well, uh, now that, that point right there really brings up the essence of it is that the, the direct experience, right? We often tend to, uh, especially if we ascribe or have been, as you say, trained in, in the, um, the allopathic style, um, which is missing a lot of what you reference and, and the majority of what you reference are ancient technologies um, for healing and, and the practice thereof. 
but we tend to kind of have that cognitive bias, if you will. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I actually I wrote a chapter in, in one of my books about um, integral health, and it, it traces the birth of Western medicine as really uh, coming from the world view of modernity and the scientific method and so on and so forth. But the pre-scientific methods, faith healing, um, you know, botanicals, uh, other, other approaches, which are pre-scientific, well, they, they've been around and they, they work. Yeah. But yeah, even the psycho-spiritual technologies that here, uh, that had been referred to as uh, shamanism. Yes, shamanism is certainly one of those, uh, you know, that, an aspect of shamanism uh, for, for healing and so on, absolutely. But um, recognizing these limitations and my exploration of other um, approaches led me to write my first book. Um, there was a, one book using integral theory. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of integral theory. I don't know how many listeners are familiar with that, but it's, it's, a, it's a perspective of multiple perspectives. It uh, looks at those different perspectives and their relationships, both inter and intra relationships. So it's multi perspectival, multi relational. Isn't and that I like known as the uh, Beck Graves model? That, that, that's, that's, that's one of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, spiral dynamics use, you know, uh, overlaps a lot with um, integral theory. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of aspects to it. But if you think in terms of um, Hegel and his dialectic, you have a, a synthesis on one hand, uh, um, a thesis on one hand, and an antithesis on the other hand. And those seem to be in opposition to one another because they are. In healthcare, the uh, Western scientific approach is highly reductionistic. We take a set of signs and symptoms, we reduce that into a diagnosis, we have scientific studies that tell us how to treat that diagnosis, and it's totally dehumanizing. Mm, kind of like the DSM-4 for psychological challenges. Yeah. Or the DSM-5 now, I guess it is. Yeah, well, we'll create a, a, a DSM category so that we can use a pharmaceutical to, to treat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, this is so wrong, man. The, the anyway. holistic approaches are, you know, sort of the antithesis. And uh, if you if you think of a Hegelian dialectic, the synthesis is to say, no, there's truths in both of those. We don't have to reject them because they approach things differently. So let's look at the synthesis, and that was sort of <clears throat> that was sort of the framework that I was using uh, in this self help book to help people understand their health from a, a, a somewhat different perspective. Right. Uh, there had been one book on uh, using integral theory, um, uh, integral health, the path to human flourishing by Elliot Dasher. And then he was running a, a set of workshops while I was writing this book um, that uh, were being conducted at, at the noetic <clears throat> sciences. So I went out to IONS and it was just wonderful to, to be uh, in that environment and so on. And I had, I, had, uh, I think, a deep insight, um, not with respect to writing the book, but with respect to my own path, my own journey. Sure. That is that, you know, I, I don't need the approval or validation of other people to do what I feel called to do, because this book was a little bit out of the mainstream, and it's not the sort of thing that a Western physician necessarily should be promoting. Um, and yet, I I just jettisoned the idea that I need to have this approved by someone. Else. This is what I feel called to do, and um, I, the, the book was reasonably successful. It's still on the market. Um, I, I think there's some valuable insights there. Um, but it sent me on a path that might be a little bit, um, you know, counterculture. Um, and I also felt that I had exhausted myself as a primary care physician um, because I'm a little bit of an empath and there's, there's a lot of drawing from that well and my well got depleted. 
Uh, but I also felt that it wasn't that challenging to take care of individuals that I wanted to expand to something bigger. So I got into administrative and executive medicine and was really heavy into systems thinking. Oh, uh -huh. we're, gonna, we're gonna affect people's lives and their health by improving the systems. And, and that's just a natural evolution, I think, of the way your, your ego begins to expand. You're, you're focused on yourself, maybe your immediate family, may, maybe your neighborhood and so on, but then you move into a bigger sphere of influence and, I, and that has continued so that now, um, you know, I, I went through a period of time where I considered myself to be a world citizen. Now I, I look at it as more of a, as the cosmos. And, and you know, I have a, a, a place in the cosmos that happens to be on this world and in this neighborhood and so on and so forth. Sure. But it's that expanding focus. And um, I've come to uh, recognition about um, how my, my ego identity, which, you know, some people call the false self, but it's, it's not really the false self. It's just a somewhat more limited, um, uh, it's self-constrained because it is singular focused on your personal safety, yeah. first of all. And, you know, the, what you're describing, it, it's just a wonderful, expansion of consciousness and, and activity that went from the ego into the we go right which includes the community and, and into systems which yeah. this, the systems you know everything uh, there are so many patterns and systems uh, even in chaos those patterns we see oh, yeah. as chaos are simply patterns we haven't recognized yet and there's systems at play that we don't understand yet and yet recognizing, as you did, that systems thinking is a greater way. I mean, it's, uh, Senge brought this out in the corporate world in the 90s and was tremendously yeah. successful with yeah. it. Fifth discipline. I read that. Yeah. Um, and I was involved with, with um, a cohort of his, Arbert Char or Otto Sharmer, uh, with an MIT program called Transforming Business, Society, and Self, which takes those same principles and turns it into a process. Yeah, so so the the goal of that process is transformation, uh -huh. uh, and I and I have so much incorporated that notion of transformation not only into my own growth uh, but in how I want to facilitate transformation. But getting back to my my story, um, in two thousand and eight, oh, I crafted a statement of purpose, um, and I can read it. It's relatively short. If you sure. Think readers would be interested in but, that. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned World Citizen earlier, and the, my first thought went to Kai D, who played Wo Fat on the original Hawaii Five-O. He had a doctorate in theology and ran a, uh, he was a rector for his Dallas Sanctuary here in Tempe, and he has a decree for world citizenship. Really? That he read on one of my, I think he was my second guest. This was back in 1990. Oh, okay. Well, I think that's in the archives. Yeah, it is. And you can, y'all can go back and look and find it. It's there. So please share yours. Yeah. So this is what I came up with. And um, it really comes from a, a different place than the mind. It comes from the heart. I said, a vision of who you are. This was the finding my song. And mm. how do I sing my song? A vision of you, who you are flows primarily from your heart space. Who am I? What is my mission? What is my purpose? I am a healer. As such, I strive to make people more whole. I am a teacher guide. As such, I strive to lead, bring people to places of better understanding. I am a seeker of truth, for only in truth is there freedom. I am a catalyst who desires to promote growth and transformation in others and facilitate their journey to reach their full potential. I am a wellspring of love to refresh and renew. I am light to dispel darkness. I am a steward of my body and of this earth. I am all these things in service to God and humanity. I am all these things and so are you, for we are one. I hold myself accountable to be all that I am. It's a, a, a favorite expression of mine, be all that you are. Um, yeah, well, that's kind of like what I've got in parentheses for my title. Yes, I, I, I love am that. we are. I am we are. I've told you that. I, I really like that. It, it, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot underlying that. There that is. resonates for me. Um, 
So with that clarity of vision, as it were, and, and a lot of humility, tr truthfully, a lot of humility, mm. um, I um, wanted to pursue more writing. I eventually got out of uh, medicine as far as a, a way to earn money um, and, and um, you know, kind of d devote my skills and, and abilities and so on. And, and threw myself into writing. Um, that, that hasn't earned very much money, but it is, I think, more authentic. And fulfilling. How, yeah, because I think in writing, um, you have the ability to affect a lot, lot, lot more people uh, than even with my systems thinking and so on a, approach to how I want to improve people's health and well-being. I'm still involved in, um, in the wellness arena through the Blue Zones Project. If people aren't familiar with that, I encourage them to, to learn about it. It's based on um, an analysis of five different communities throughout the world where people live longer, healthier lives. And it's in taking those principles and um, applying them in programs and education uh, so that people can learn to live longer, healthier lives. And some of it is diet and exercise. A lot of it is social engagement. A lot of it, it has to do with faith, um, community uh, involvement, volunteer, volunteerism. And Could you repeat the name of that, please? That's the Blue Zones Project. Blue Zones. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's all research-based, and it's okay. very, very elegant. I'll, I'll put a link in the descriptions for the viewers sure. to find so I'm involved with the Blue Zones Project in Southwest Florida, uh, specifically helped to get my community where I live, um, Blue Zones certified. I, I think that that's, you know, I, I feel good. I feel that that's, you know, in keeping with my core mission here. Mm -hmm. um, and now- With, um, with the core, I, would, I, I want to interrupt you for just a moment and go back to IONS. Yeah. Uh, or, or to IONS. Um, <clears throat> I'd met Edgar Mitchell some years ago, and, and of course, the Institute of Noetic Sciences was his creation after coming back from his lunar mission. Right. Um, in that mission, uh, when I met him, he eventually confided in me that there's another presence there. There was a metallic silver cylinder that came out and was spiraling around the LAM all the way down to the surface. He told me at the time, he says, you can't tell anybody, please, till after I'm dead. Otherwise, it will cause a lot of problems for me. I get it. Uh, and yet, he came back and, and put this organization together and drew the people that really have made a huge difference in a lot of lives. Um, and obviously, you connected with that and, and had a great experience with it, too. Um, so how, how do these kinds of things relate to this? shift in how we participate in life and the direction that you found uh i know you'd mentioned that you know you felt like you were on the fringe that you were it didn't really matter whether people supported you or not this is the way that this was your truth and how you were presenting it which is how we ought to um, and it and i understand the point of humility that we come to in order to be able to do that because we face the insurmountable, right? And, and uh, euphemistically, and that's in the acceptance of others. Yeah, so to, to take a stab at, at the question, I, um, in, in case people aren't familiar, IONS is very involved in consciousness research and applying scientific principles to better understand consciousness. But um, I have you know, been grappling with what is consciousness. I don't have a, a great answer for that at this time, but I continue to pursue my interests and to some extent still continue to pursue my interest in understanding that but there's a um, uh, kind of a, a rational part of my brain, the, the cognitive part of my brain that wants to understand it at that level. And I'm less interested in that now and more in the experiential level, because I, I think that that's really where the rubber hits the road. Mm -hmm. I don't really have to understand this because someone wrote about it and had some insights that they shared and, and that's, that's great. That was their experience. 
it's, it's interesting to think about, but it's more how to experience consciousness, how to raise human consciousness, not only in myself, but through my writing. I have a post on my, uh, my website about method, meaning, intent, and, uh, and how I try to go about raising human consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it's at, at different levels. It's at the individual level, it's at the collective level, and it's at the level of the noosphere, which that's, is collective consciousness of the planet. And that's just the beginning. Now, in this systems, levels, those kinds of things, one of the questions I, I, I'd asked uh, Dr. Irvin Laszlo, kind of the grandfather of quantum thinking, right? Um, looking at it from a systems standpoint, because I made the comparison between the multiplane awareness, which you've experienced, the uh, spiral dynamics model, the solfeggio tones, and the quantum physics model of Nepian close, all revolving around nine levels. Mm -hmm. And that in a, the systems approach that, and I don't know if you thought about this, this may be a question you hadn't considered yet. How do those, at least for models, compare in the stepping down of the energy of oneness to the individuated self yeah so is that I, gut level experience because you you talked about finding it the your mission and vision in the heart space right then had that so you've put that intention out to the universe how does the universe respond is that a gut level driven activity kind of like the first second third brain philosophy of the indigenous or is it how did it respond how did you respond to it well, for, first there's the recognition that consciousness, which I view as um, having the unmanifest aspect, the unmanifest universe formless. and the formless, and then the manifest universe, multiverse, whatever, uh, and that those are, um, that, that energy is involved there. I like to think of that energy as love. Um, but there is a, a stepping down of um, vibrational frequency, if you will, or condensation of energy that goes from these higher dimensions, and nine is, is fine. I don't know if that's the right number. I've heard 13, uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't matter because conceptually there's a notion of our um, oneness of being going through a, a stepwise series of moving to lower and lower vibrational levels mm -hmm. and you know if, if we say well we're living in a third dimensional reality here um, but we're we're aware well most aware of the third dimensional reality we are living in a multi-dimensional reality mm -hmm. and having a growing awareness of that uh, particularly um, you know, the fifth dimension, which, which, you know, embodies love, mm -hmm. uh, I think in a more tangible way, right. uh, and beginning to experience this a little bit, not because again, I'm looking for the experiential understanding, not, not so much the cognitive um, understanding, the cognitive helps to give you a framework. Well, it comes. Uh, but, but it's really, oh, okay. I, I just had an, um, experience of, um, you know, alternative reality that in and of itself is problem with language because I mean, we dream that's an alternative reality where that's, that's every bit as real as our conversation right now that we're having. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just happening, um, in, in a different way, energetically, um, with, with our consciousness. So um, I'm, I'm still trying to you know, navigate this a little right. bit in, in it, from an experiential standpoint. Would that be consciousness or actually awareness? To, to, to being aware of that you're aware being because being I think there's, you're having there's an aware there's, there's a relationship between consciousness and awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think, um, that I'm, I'm seeking for that. 
I'm seeking to experience that awareness more fully rather than, because I believe it's happening all the time. Oh, absolutely. There, there's a, a great piece called The New Science that were, it's actually the memoirs of Wilbert Smith, who ran Canada's UFO investigation program in the 1950s. Uh, he had conversations with what he called people from elsewhere. One of the things that they, uh, well, there were three things that, that really struck me and resonated fully. One, we start with a point and our awareness determines our reality. So that's the condensation into that point of light mm -hmm. and then coming from there. So that's essentially the zero dimension. And if you start from there, then there are 13 because we're on the third, conceivably right. fourth, right. and right. then the other nine. Okay. So from that perspective, then they state that we don't understand nothingness. And that's the basis for their science and system of understanding millions of years ahead of us. Mm. And the third thing was that their concept of time is the measurement of the change in entropy. Right. And I actually had, had drawn that conclusion myself. I, I hadn't read that anywhere. But that's because I struggle with trying to understand time. And that was the way that made sense to me. That yeah. time was, um, you know, re really a way to measure entropy. And I've been playing with the idea, I'm not totally convinced about it, but that uh, love, um, you know, there's, there's a relationship between evolution um, is really the expanding entropy of love is, is, is really yeah, what evolution is. Yeah, I, I term it as, time, but it's it's changing in a way where where you know things are getting to be more loving, um, I think, and so I've been playing with that idea. Um, I don't know if I'm going to you know eventually reject it, but right now I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like a loving thing to do. Could we also kind of, uh, and this is uh, something that came to me some time ago. We ascend at the speed of surrender, right? Because at the core of our being, that unqualified absolute, that core energy, the, the energy, you know, it's like you and I, we're here physically, we appear physical, and yet the reality is we're just energy, right? There's really no physicality to us. It's the constructs that some form of intelligence beyond us has been able to achieve that's at the core of our being. Yes. So the the change that bind us are self forged. You know, in many respects, we're prisoners of our own mind. Mm. In many respects, um, surrendering uh, is the path to ascension. Um, and um, it's it's in some ways easy to talk about, but it seems to be difficult to do. <laughs> well, like, isn't that the most? Hey, uh, I'm surrendering right now. Am, am I still being recorded or have I ascended? <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, and yet this, in that simplicity is so much complexity. We just tend to focus on the complexity and forget about the simplicity as well as understanding we live half outside and half inside. You know, we're talking about this inner development, this inner awareness, these internal thoughts and and manifestations that we then see reflecting in us because maybe we're doing the right thing, right? We're following that intuitive gut response of, okay, yeah, I need to go this direction. Well, I see it as a dance, a dance between non-duality and duality. And we live in both, in both, mm -hmm. both of those. And, um, you know, it's, that's it's, the nature of formless and form. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. We we are going somewhere. Uh, sometimes we're going around in circles, which seeming to get nowhere. But I think for for you, put a space in there, and you can be now here. Be here now. I <laughs> no 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 argument there. I'm fond of saying that. But sometimes when you know when you're at a meeting and they expect you to say here I am, I say now I am. <laughs> um, but. In in many respects, uh, I've gotten more and more comfortable with not knowing. It's like the the ambiguity of not knowing. There's something to embrace there. That's where the awe is. Is it not? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to figure it out. In fact, I, I have it written somewhere that you finally figured it out when you realize there's nothing to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems like a, you know a Zen a Zen Cohen, um, <laughs> but uh, unintended on that one. <laughs> Although I'm not. Well, I do have some Cohens, um, and I know a few myself too. <laughs> <laughs> You're hilarious. I love it. Um, so, you know, it's it's a dance. We're um, on a evolutionary journey, I think, individually, collectively, uh, planetarily, and so on and so forth. And th there's something r really to, you know, stand back and appreciate from that place of wonder, from that place of awe, from that place of gratitude uh, that says, wow, this is, th th this is something to behold um, and, and not try to figure it out, just to immerse yourself in um, what, what this, this life offers us. Right. I mean, it's just, it, it is mind boggling to, to, to even begin to try to appreciate that at the depth that it that it can be appreciated. And that's the, the aspect of the surrender, right? It's get, getting to that place of just allowing yourself, you know, it, the misnomer is that, oh, it, you let go. That means you let go of anything, everything, control, all of it. Well, yeah, you do. And yet there's this essence that you are that is in complete control. Well, I, I think what you're letting go of is some of these uh, egoic notions of self mm -hmm. and what you are, um, you know, kind of relaxing into is this integrated uh, higher self, which is multidimensional and um, you don't really have to uh, w work to integrate yourself. You just have to allow it. You have right. to, and you observe the process and participate where it opens doors for you to do so. So let's look at that for just a moment. I think that, you know, it's really essential to kind of unpack an example, right? Because we're talking a lot of stuff and sure it makes sense, but how do you do it, right? What's it like? Um, what might we anticipate as a, an experienceable reality? So do you have an instance that that comes up and, and maybe something just popped in um, that you could offer as an example as to an intention uh, a process and an eventual outcome that was beyond the the initial comprehension right something that you've done professionally where you've just said, oh, I don't know, you know, I wonder if this can be done. Let's see. And take off from there. Well, I think, you know, the universe is sending us messages all the time. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we miss the synchronicities and the coincidences and so on and so forth. I've had some in my life that you, you can't explain other than setting an intention and, and opening up to them. It's probably too long a story to get into for our interview today, but those, those things absolutely happen. Um, I, I think that for, for me, my personal, I could say challenge to myself, but I don't believe there are any challenges. I think that there are only opportunities um, be, because I think that our, our natural instinct is when we're, you know, f faced with wanting something we don't have, or you know, the universe is is mistreating us at this moment. Is that we say, well, this this is a challenge. What am I trying to learn at the time of this challenge? I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it. I think the right way for me to think about it is, how in this moment can I be the best version of myself given these circumstances? Sure. And so that's the opportunity. And to me, the, the, the base opportunity that we're faced with day to day, day in and day out, is to be the most loving self that we can be. Mm -hmm. And to me, I see the perceptual blocks and expressive blocks. That 
Um, we don't always see the love around us in people, in creation, in, in whatever you're looking at or uh, at, wherever you're at at that moment, loves are all around you. You don't perceive it. Um, and part of that's from the conditioned mind, part of it's from the egoic mind, whatever. But you, you're missing something there perceptually. And then expressively, you know, I believe that we have the essence of divinity within each and every one of us, and that we can express that more fully uh, sometimes than other times. So the, the, the challenge slash opportunity is to be aware because, um, you know, if you're not aware that, that that's an that's a impediment or a handicap. So to be aware perceptually and be aware, do a gut check on yourself. Am I being the most loving I can be in this moment? Right. Um, and uh, that, that to me, if we're um, approaching life that way on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we are doing it from a place of presence that there is a vibrational quality to having that level of presence. It has an impact on people in the world around us. And so it, it's gotten real, real simple for me. I don't have to figure it out beyond that. Uh, right. to me, I can even jettison the statement of purpose that I, I shared earlier because that's too complicated. Just love more. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> well, and, and you know, you, you talk about challenge and opportunity. And, and what comes up is the opportunity for change, right? To, to go from the prescriptive to something that feels more resonant or, or freeing in the moment. And, you know, it, it's um, brought up an example that, that we used this um, over a decade ago. I was on the board for the American Society for Training Development here in the Phoenix chapter. It's now the Association for Talent Development. I was saddled with the uh, construction of the annual conference. And I had heard this phrase and it really made sense, challenge to change. There's only three letters difference. And at the time I heard it, I knew the LLE was liabilities, limitations, and excuses. And those are all personal, right? So we created this um, conference called The Shift, challenge to change, removing liabilities, limitations, and excuses in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And what I hoped that would do was trickle through because all of our, it seems, and, and you may see this too, all of our personal practices generally come from the business or educational fields, something that we experience on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And then we, because we begin to question, hey, this doesn't feel quite right, what does? Right? How did you navigate that process? Well, I have a fair amount of experience in the in the business community in being a change agent, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, re really, my last job um, was both rewarding and soul sucking. But it was basically to take um, a two hundred fifty bed uh, facility that was uh, decertified by CMS. Uh, that was being sued by the Department of Justice for care violations. Uh, it had a veterans home, state veterans home, and was uh, in deep, deep trouble with the, um, the VA and be one of a team of people to take that from a, uh, a, a place of, uh, of failure to a place of success. And to me, there's structural elements that go with that. That's not my forte. Uh, but fortunately, uh, on the team, that was one person's forte. My, my forte was really in the cultural aspects of it, is changing the culture. Uh, and you had good people who, who were caring people. They were involved in healthcare because they're caring people. Mm -hmm. um, but they needed guidance. They needed leadership uh, in, in um, achieving their potential. I'm a, I'm a big, big believer that we have... Um, unmet potential, both as, as, as businesses and as organizations and, you know, as individuals in our lives. My wife is a, a, a school teacher. I think the education system is a place where we can do a lot 
to teach people life skills, to mm-hmm. help them uh, be, be better people, really. And just in reference to that, uh, years ago, I was a high school teacher for a number of years as well. Um, regular ed, special ed, residential treatment centers, mm-hmm. at charter schools, full charge of the curriculum. And at the end of that, I went back and, and I was getting my second master's degree in business. It was a Master of Arts in Organizational Management. And for that, I wrote a project plan for a model school slash village that was based on holistic education, which mm-hmm. we in America, we know nothing about. We don't show it, it you know. Yeah. Um, and I took it to the director of education for child protective services in Arizona. And he says, Zen, I'd love it. You're light years ahead of us. I don't know if we'll ever get there. Yeah. Well, um, you know, it's good to have a vision and it's good to um, throw that out into the universe, uh, morphic fields, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there there are some uh, schools, uh, I'm familiar with one, although I don't know the name of it at this time, uh, in India, um, founded by a, a very famous yogi, um, and very holistic. Uh, of course, you know they culturally they're they're in a different place, I think, than we are in in mm-hmm. you know, the Western world. But um, I think we both agree that there's a lot that can be done to reform education that would um, you know be be beneficial for individuals and first off you know look at the kids as kids not products yeah that's a good that's a good starting point (laughs) right because that's ultimately their products they don't need to be that takes their ability to choose who they are away well i think that there's a there's also a uh, tendency to reinforce conformity Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in my education, I could have been encouraged to uh, embark on a, a more countercultural course um, that, you know, p- potentially I could have achieved more in the time that I've been here, uh, given the right uh, uh, framework educationally that would encourage that. Um, but I'm not, you know, certainly not bitter about that. I had a great education and a great educational experience. But it points to the fact that we, we, we set up our education really to uh, address, um, you know, on the normal standard distribution curve, what's, what's, what's right under the middle part of the, the bell curve. And if, you, if you're too, too far off to the right, and a lot of the special ed, uh, uh, or to the left, you know, a lot of special ed people, and I did a lot of work with, uh, with the developmentally disabled in my career, a lot, a lot of work. Um, then you're, you're not in that. And if, but if you're on the other end of it too, if you're gifted, you know, we, we don't really have the kinds of resources for um, bringing out the, the strengths in the gifted children. Yeah, the, the brilliance is often put under a bushel basket, right? Yeah. It, and the challenging, I, I know for me, and, and you probably did too, um, and my parents didn't even tell me on my 30s what my IQ level was when I was tested for fear that I would become an egotistical, you know, son of a bitch with it. Um, What happened though is that, and you may have experienced this too, there was this sense of being on that third or fourth or maybe even fifth standard distribution element right where you're so weird that people don't know how to understand you let alone um work with you in some fashion that honors and accepts and acknowledges you yeah well i can relate to that um very much um i won't share with with your viewers here what my iq is but it's pretty high. I'd like to think my EQ is pretty high too, because oh, I actually you know, think I, that's a that's in in many respects more important. In life, um, is such such a such an important uh, metric to to you know t- not only to be aware of but to um, help people make progress uh, be- because 
they're so shackled in a way if if your emotional intelligence is is low and it, and it can right. be brought up well uh, it, and it can and, and generally if I, if i can offer something that in those situations like you and i have experienced we chose to go a different direction because we could we we were aware of our ability to choose early for those who don't they get inundated with the labels the categories the judgments the criticisms the the being outcasts and social misfits that they never developed the social skills of which the eq is a primary factor right right you know because because you're you're just a can i use obscene language on this program yeah who cares yeah, I mean, you're just a fuck up. <laughs> I mean, so uh, you're, 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 and yet there are so many examples of of these brilliant, brilliant people who dropped out of school. Um, Albert Einstein, you know, working in the patent office there. Um, Ted Turner. <laughs> Ted Turner. Um, you know, boy, the list goes on for, mm -hmm. for people that we recognize. Yeah, these, these are brilliant, brilliant people. And I'm not saying I'm in that category, but uh, we 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 have a ways to go um, in improving our um, our education system, but in helping people to reach their fullest potential. Because in a way, I, I think that that's um, a, a, uh, so, something that we all aspire towards is maximizing potential. You know, as a, as a parent, you, you want that for your child. But as a society, shouldn't shouldn't we want to encourage our citizens to you know meet the the full potential that is within each and every one of them and and be working diligently to do that uh, in, in well, this is where those those other organizations that we were talking about earlier and in, in the the early ability of those who had the wherewithal the resources the intelligence to set up the early systems from which you know industrial revolution and, and dewey being you know uh, one of the main proponents of our educational system in america today and that was simply to create factory workers to give them enough education to where they could go to work and produce now we're at a point where we need to have enough education to learn how to heal ourselves in the world yeah it's sort of the um uh you know the commodity students as a commodity to uh, maximize their productivity for um, supporting a consumer-based materialistic world, um, and and you know you you can say well I guess that worked a little bit or maybe a lot of it but it's not working now. <laughs> no, and, and we're here and we do have the ability to create that change. And to, and to make it effectively, it's just, we don't know. This is an experiment right now. The silver lining of COVID that, you know, this brought you and I together, um, brought hundreds of people together in the virtual space to start asking these similar questions. So, so let me share some thoughts about change because um, I put that in the context of evolution, evolution of consciousness and so on and so forth. But um, you know, in, in integral theory, but other places as well, they draw a distinction between horizontal change and, and uh, horizontal evolution rather and vertical evolution. So if we look at the evolution of the automobile, um, changing from a carburetor to a fuel injector, that's an example of horizontal change. It's an mm -hmm. incremental thing. Mm -hmm. uh, vertical change though is, well, We've replaced horses and buggies with these powered engine driven mechanical devices to transport you. So that's a vertical evolution. That's a, that's a shift. And right. that's the time that we're living in now. We're, we're living in a shift time of um, expansion of consciousness, awareness, recognition that the old paradigms the old ways of doing things, whether they're educational, whether they're political, whether they are uh, in business and so on and so forth, those things aren't, don't work very well. And modernity's taken us far. Um, you know, post-modernity's taken us somewhat far, but it's, it's that dialectic that I was talking about, you know, thesis and antithesis 
Mm -hmm. um, th there seems to be too much um, opposing ideologies there, but then the synthesis of that post postmodern, and you can say integral falls in that category. I, I mean, there's that, something ego satisfying about about saying that. But <laughs> it, take take the labels off because labels in and of themselves are limiting. Exactly, and this is what happened. Labels. The the um, I'm sorry, you just triggered me, right? In a good way. <laughs> uh, and and that was that in an interview I had on the Jeff Mara podcast, I was asked because I've heard voices since I was a kid, and Jeffrey Mishlove even interviewed me about that, um, and, and gained great credibility uh, from that as well. But Jeff asked me about this voice that I'd been hearing and. and who is it? What have I ever asked who it was? What is his name? No, I didn't. Why? Because it resonated. I didn't have to. It yeah. it gave me what I felt at my core when I needed it. Yes. And so why would I want to, I want to say decimate it with a label? Yeah. So if I was interviewing you now, I would ask you about that resonator i i call it a truth resonator yeah uh, but but w where does that come from i have my own ideas and I'll, and I'll share them but i am interested in hearing your ideas oh i'd love to answer it uh it, it comes from the core of my being it resonates um starting in the gut and I, I would say if that were the the core center and it just resonates everywhere through my entire being <clears throat> there's no distinction of different areas that have been left out See, I like to think of knowledge as this secondary knowledge that we get from other people's experiences. We read about it in books and, and so on and so forth, they, or they tell us and so on. And that's one type of knowledge. Um, then there's the experiential knowledge, which we touched upon earlier in the interview. And that's, that's a more potent type of knowledge. because yeah, It eliminates the BS. It's drawn from your experience. But then there's this, and I, and I think it's in the, in the collective consciousness and unconsciousness, this intuitive knowledge, this stuff, it's like, hey, I don't know why I know this is true, but this is true, and I'm going to listen to it. And, and that, that, to me, is something that we need not only to be more open to, but be, be willing to talk about in conversations yeah. with one another. That doesn't yeah. make you weird. That means you're, you're tuned into something. Authentic. It's authentic. That's the perfect word for it. Um, and um, I, I just think that that's something I don't read about very much. I think the Gnostics, um, we, you know, they had that appreciation. What is Gnosis is, is this true knowing, this knowledge. I think that, that the whole idea of, of you know, ions and, and um, no, noetic, it's like, no, this is, this is deep knowing that, that goes beyond, um, you know, reading about or goes beyond experiencing. It is within the true core of you, both mind, body, or all three, mind, body, and spirit. Because mm -hmm. we are, um, you know, with spiritual beings having a, a physical e existence. But if you, if you buy into, and I do and buy into the, the notion of embodied spirituality, this vessel in and of itself it, it, it is a spiritual expression. It's, a, it's almost artificial to, to uh, say, well, you know, the body isn't as good as the mind and is not as good as the spirit. I mean, it's all one package here and it's all, it, it's embodied spirituality. It is, and, and I'll validate, corroborate, uh, resonate with that. And my personal experience as a teen, when I prayed to know what truth was, and I was asked to die, uh, and was willing to die for it, and then the following week, I was asked, and I ended up in the white light and beyond. And my willingness to die was because I wanted, the truth to me was cosmic consciousness. Mm. And so through the experience, I got a really short uh, experiential trip through it, in which when I returned, I was left with this indisputable knowing that we are all cosmic consciousness condensed into form. And that's exactly what we're talking about. 
right? That point of light that bounces back and forth between here and the great light, if you want to put it into native terms, until we get the memo. Yeah. Or until the rest of this these collective consciousnesses around us get to a point where this shift is ready to take place and then maybe those of us who've done this elsewhere for a while have come here to say oh yeah okay so let's dredge up what information is already here and present it again a little different art articulation yeah. that maybe makes more sense for the modernity and then go into a, a future self with this kind of understanding that we have and can work with each other to do yeah so for 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 the viewers who didn't pick up on that for those of us who have done this elsewhere the elsewhere is you know different dimensional and perhaps galactic uh lives and uh experiences uh, at least that's the way i interpreted it um yeah so so zen let's let's just project for a moment that if we were operating from this place of recognition and awareness of being you know embodied spirituality of of this cosmic consciousness how the world would be different i mean look at the way we treat one another look at the way we treat animals that we use for food sources it's just it's horrific look at the the injustices that uh, we seem to be inured towards. Um, you, you couldn't you couldn't tolerate any of that because it it would be so contrary to that awareness and that reality. And I do think um, that we are headed in that direction to the you know what some people call Homo divinicus, Homo sapien 2.0 you know, homo illuminatus, whatever, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Part of Marx Hever calls it the uh, homo universalis, I think. That, that's, that's another term. Yeah. I do think that's the direction we're going, and that makes me optimistic for the future. And yes, these are growing pains that we're going through, and, and it, it, is, it is uncomfortable, but let's not lose sight of, you know, humanity's made a lot of progress in, in mm -hmm. the time we've been on this planet. And when you look in these big time scales, you could see that progress. And so I think there's reason to believe we're going to continue to make progress. And oh, absolutely. we're going to make that vertical you know, shift, as it were, to, to that um, state where, where our potential as human beings is, is more realized. I think we'll be telepathic. I think we'll, we'll um, you know, reject. Uh, I think we already are. The, the violence and the well it will be more in our awareness yeah right. but we'll, we'll be there uh and this opportunity i i know i've noticed just with uh, another silver lining coming out of covid is this opportunity that we have of connecting because the sequestration and the session on self-hygiene turned people inward and they started asking questions yeah uh, you and i just went deeper because we we're already doing it and then we are better prepared for those who come out of it going, hey, what's going on? There's all kinds of confusion. And the obfuscation of truth is now reaching a level where it's obvious to pretty much everyone if they look. And now what? Right? Where do we go? Once we understand the truth <clears throat> of what is, all these patterns and processes you were talking about that lower level human development entertains mm. then what what's next how do we learn to be that individuated form that's a thread in the tapestry and we learn how to nestle nestle in or dance with the other threads in a better fashion so the tapestry actually looks beautiful instead of cacophonic yeah yeah well it's like the uh, crayola box of crayons mm. colors but all you know, all getting along just fine in that box. <laughs> right. And it's not a paint by numbers game, although it could be if we understood what the true mathematics of the constructs of reality are. 
Well, that would be maybe a discussion for the future. Um, yeah, the mathematics, the sacred geometry, the uh, oh, you see some of the um, maybe quantum dimensions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. And as you know, and I know, just having this conversation, the words ripple through the thoughtmosphere and others of like resonance, if you will, or near like resonance now have access and it will filter through and at whatever subtle moments appropriate, it'll enter their consciousness because they're questioning. Yes, yes. Well, I, I kind of think in many respects, it's more important to have the right questions than the right answers. Absolutely. Uh, because that, you know, that, that process is one of curiosity and investigation and exploration. I think exploration is really mm -hmm. um, is the best way to describe that how that opens up a door. Right, Otto Scharmer and, and his uh, theory U process call it calls it co-presencing. Right. Where you you as the group you choose to just be fully present with the question. Yeah. But you're right, and you're right. That question is more important than the answers. Yeah, and uh, have you ever participated in a Bohm dialogue where there's a lot of silence, but it's basically um, uh, a, a shared collective consciousness of the group. Um, and then when someone you know has something they feel compelled to share, an insight or whatever, they say it and, yeah, glad you mentioned insight. But, yes, I have. And not by that name, but uh, definitely the process. Um, James Redfield writes about it as the third discipline in the Celestine Prophecy, where you don't speak until you feel compelled to from within. Do you want to know something that is just a little curious synchronicity? Yeah. I just read the Celestine Prophecy. It's the ah, well, how perfect that I read, um, and it's because I always had meant to read it, uh, but then three different things it came up in conversation and and um, uh, things that I was looking at three different ways. It's also some of my writing has been uh, compared to you know that visionary. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, approach to things and I just finished reading it less than a week ago <laughs> you know I, it, I had so many friends telling me that I needed to read this but when it first came out and I'm sure I sounded arrogant as hell and saying well from what you're telling me that's how I live already why would I need to read about it yeah um and yet here we are today still living it and yeah. talking about it more and having that Mm, not necessarily global acceptance, at least a larger acceptance of the principles and being able to have conversations about it, kind of like uh, our old friend, Mr. Dennis Patako and what he's doing with the friendship bench and the salons, right? There's that psychologically safe and intellectually humble environment from which to explore. Right. And it's, it's really exploring our shared humanity, which mm -hmm. is his, his words and Reimagining it. Yeah, it's it's um, not just talking the talk, it's walking the walk. And uh, it's just so marvelous. You know, the, the, the structure or the space that he's uh, created and the people participating in that space. It just, it really is. It's, it's inspirational. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully it'll be um, duplicable across others that, that have the same kind of inkling and, and have access to networks that Dennis doesn't. And we can have a, a, you know, multiple points of order, if you will. Um, speaking of points of order, uh, we're, we're coming to a, a close of our time. And I'd like to ask you one last question. On a very practical and pragmatic level, what kind of advice could, would you offer to those who are considering questioning their own reality? I will uh, just, I'm so pleased you asked that question. I was hoping that you would. Um, 
because this is what I wrote a good number of years ago, and it's my advice. Um, it keys off a little bit of what I was talking about before about perceiving and expressing love. Um, so this is my advice. Be filled with love. Let it overflow. You are a fountainhead of love. Do nothing to restrain this, to hold it back. Do not try and parcel out your love. Can you contain the air, the oceans? Why would you want to try? So let it be with your love at all times, under all circumstances. Love with the fullness of your being, because that's who you are in the essence of your being, a creature of love. You are happiest when you are the most loving, because at those moments, you give expression to your being. Express yourself more fully. Mm. Now that resonates, and I know it will with the audience too. Hopefully, don't test it, <laughs> do it. Or you can test it, because you're going to learn how to do it. But just allow that process. And, and wonderful words, Victor, yeah. I totally appreciate and honor and love our conversation today. Oh yeah, this was fun. But it was, it, it, was, it, it was deep and meaningful. And, um, you know, I appreciate your uh, giving me the opportunity to have this conversation together with you and your viewers. And as always, it's an apocalyptic chat, right? We, <laughs> we have covered a lot of knowledge. Well, yes, but most people don't really know the true meaning of apoco apocalypse, apocalyptic. So, um, I will just share that um, it's it's not the the notion of the end of the world. Um, it's it's from the Greek apocalypsis, and it means to disclose, to reveal, and that's what this conversation has been about. It's been um, an opportunity to disclose and reveal together. Um, would you would you agree that I did absolutely I that on absolutely the head? it was a state of vulnerableness that we were able to achieve because we were in love. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking of the Beatles song, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so uh, all we need is love, absolutely. And again, I thank you so much for the time, the effort, and the love that you put into your work and and others. Too. Thank you, Zen. Thank, thank you for who you are and what you do. I mean, I'm deeply appreciative of, um, you know, of, of you and, and what you're accomplishing and, and sharing and, and doing. So it is truly an expression of yourself. Namaste. In mm -hmm. Lakesh. Amen. And namaste and in la catch and thank you for sticking with us through this episode of one world in a new world i'm your host zen benefield and i will see you next time